the coming of the black men. Art thou the first man that was born, or wast thou made before the hills? Job 15, verse 7. I have often been asked by the friends of the black race, where did the Negro come from? And what was really the cause of his complexion and texture of hair? They were really sincere in their questions and really wanted to know. The reason for this is that popular historians have left the black race without a common brotherhood and have cut the branch of the tree from which he sprung and severed the link in the ascending chain of racial evolution. They readily talk about branch and blood of all the races of mankind. Yet, they exclude the Negro and rather place him on the lowest scale of the human family. When it comes to the description of other races, they give their direct origin such as the white race is known as an Indo-European race and other nations such as Jews, Arabs, Turks, Chinese, Japanese, and other Asiatic and Pacific nations, even the American Indians are known as Semites. These biased writers invade Africa, divide the African nation into separate units, using such terms as Hamites and Negroes. They also claim the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Berbers, Libyans are are brunettes or dark whites. They speak of the Negroes as a separate and inferior race and say that from time immemorial have been hewers of wood and drawers of water for their more fortunate brethren, that the Negro has neither built a stone city nor suggested a creed. While these historians admit that the race belongs to the human family, Without a direct connection, they evade the expression, but nevertheless they use the argument by saying that the Negro is the only race that does not have a tradition of the flood. The Negro is not classified as an Indo-European, neither as a Semite or even a Hamite. What is he? We are positive that there are but three races in a generic sense, namely the Hamite, the European, and the Semite. Other races are just secondary or subsidiary races belonging to these respective stocks. Ham today is classified as white, but during the days of slavery he was very black. The so-called Christian nations that tolerated slavery boasted their conscience by saying that it was a decree from the curse of Noah and that the black race, a descendant of Ham, should be a slave as a fulfillment of Noah's curse. And because Ham laughed at his father's nakedness while he was in a drunken stupor, Noah said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. During the days of slavery, Ham was considered a black man in 1861. Jefferson Davis, in his famous speech endorsing secession of states, referred to the Negro as the son of Ham during the Italian-Ethiopian War in 1935. Ham was considered a brunette white man in the northern and eastern part of Africa. South of the Sahara, his descendants were classified as Negroes but not Hamites. Such arguments are not even good jokes to intelligent people. On the other hand, if Noah's curse had affected the course of Hamitic history, it would have fallen on the posterity of Canaan and not the so-called Negroes, 
since the ancestor of the Ethiopian or Negro race was Cush, another son of Ham. Yet the curse was on Canaan. Dr. Blyden says in his book, Liberia's Offering, that the prophecy would have been fulfilled when the Jews under the leadership of Joshua invaded Canaan and conquered the Canaanites and made them their servants when they, the Jews, had been slaves or servants to the Egyptians, Hamites, which fulfilled the prophecy as servant of servants. The subhuman relation has another expression in the children of white and black parents. They are called mulatto or hybrid, but children between white and Indians and other dark races were termed as half-breeds. It is often claimed that these mulattoes become sterile in the third generation, which supports a theory that the difference between the white and black is similar to the relationship between horse and mule. This is not true. For I have seen octoroons with seven or eight children in their family, so white until you could not tell where Ham left off and Jophat started. If this theory was true, the handicap would be in the first generation where the resistance would be greater. The mulatto is not a hybrid like a mule. He reproduces like any other human. In fact, there are no such groups as mulattoes. They are half-breeds and mixed breeds. The same applies to other races. These mulattoes are regular in their features just like other races and sometimes more impressive in personality. Some of the outstanding men in America and other countries were what they call mulattoes. Such men as Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, Mordecai Johnson, and others in America. Also, General Antonio Mecco, the Cuban rebel leader, would be classed as a mulatto. They would be a credit to any race, black or white. Here I would like to distinctly like to be distinctly understood that I am not advocating amalgamation nor intermarriage among races in America, for that will never happen. But we are defending the Negro blood and trying to prove that it is not inferior. The mixed breeds are not mulattoes nor hybrids, but real men, and its pure-blooded Negroes are real men and the black races comes down from the ancient days with the richest heritage in history. Our race does not have to mix to rise. I have critically noticed in my research of various books written by prejudiced authors on the subjects of anthropology and history that they often major the text of their comparison in the difference between the black and white races more than they do all other darker races combined constantly refer to Negroes as inferiors, thus measuring the standard of race on the basic theory of evolution, a science which achieved its preeminence under Charles Darwin and followed the scores of others which strive to prove that the Negro race is the link between the missing link of other races and the anthropoid. This group of scientists describe man as a member of the order of mammals called primate, or primate, including apes, monkeys, and men divided into three groups, but relatively so with a common ancestral primate, an anthropoid ape of which they claim now extent the missing link. They further claim that the Negro in Africa was the first to evolve from this ape like man, and thus from the Negro, the brown, yellow, and white races evolved in succession. This theory was also sustained by Camper in his measurement of skulls in which he claimed that the Negro is an immediate step between the white race and the orang ape. The orang measures 64 degrees. 
the Negro 7 at the white 80, which places the Negro in measurement only six degrees above that of the eighth. Darwin and Camper are worse than ridiculous, for the size of the head has nothing to do with the size of the brain. One man may have a large head, but thin gray matter, while the other may have a small head, but possess a greater depth of the susa and a thicker gray matter. The latter would be far more intelligent than the former with a large head and a thin gray matter. If large heads were the symbols of intelligence, elephants would rule the world. Their heads are large enough, but unfortunately, they, they contain no great matter and often used for the seat of his master. The theory of evolution is built on a false hypothesis. While the argument may carry some biological similarities or some likeness, and physical structure between the races of men and the apes. But scientists have not yet been able to discover one single fact sufficient to defend their claim in all the prospective fields of systematic zoology. Supplement. Alexander Goldenwise, the scientist in his book, Early Civilization, pages 5 and 6, says, There is, however, no indication that the revealed differences between white and Negro brains stand for potential inferiority on the part of the Negro. If there was such a thing as a missing link, where is it? Some claim that the ape man is now extinct. He died out. Then why not resurrect its skeleton as they have often prehistoric animals? If they should find such creatures, how could they prove that it was the ancestor of the Adamic race? Professor Eugene Du Bois claimed to have discovered the missing link. Pithecanthropus man at Wajak, Java in 1891. But Dr. Felix von Lushan, the German scientist, said that Dr. Debor's discovery turned out to be an oversized ape. And what scientists have been able to reason from the unknown to the known and arrived at an elaborate conclusion? None. If man evolved from an anthropoid primate, why was it that the ape did not evolve? The same cause upon the same thing in the same climate and environment would have produced the same effect. Man did not come from an evolutionary process. He was created in man from the beginning. The creator did not have to make a monkey blueprint to make a man. And if there is any monkey business, man made that himself, but not his creator. I have seriously wondered what was the cause of the science of evolution and to what purpose could it attain? And why would those who are classed as outstanding scholars burn their midnight oil on such a worthless and frivolous subject? But I soon discovered that the logical tendency of the absurd evolutionist arguments were founded on racial biases, biasness. But I hesitated to commit myself on such criticism, however logical my treatise might have been, until I had found some anthropologist who would be an established witness to my claim. After that, I found in the volume written by Oscar Purcell, The Races of Man, pages 6 and 7, in which he says, As soon as the term evolution was invented for the typical varieties of the human race, a dispute arose as to whether the nations of the earth are div divisible into different species on only different varieties. Often, as in this instance, it is the highest and most obscure problem which most strangely attracts the inexperienced, hurrying to premature and worthless conclusion. Nor was it even with unprejudiced minds for 
Some tried to harmonize it with the Hebrew legend of the first human pair, while others strove to establish the plurality of species to withdraw the sympathy from the Negro and to hush the appeal of consciousness against the degradation of man. I was very much pleased to find that Mr. Oscar Parshall agrees with me and substantiates my contentions that the fundamental cause of the science of evolution are based upon racial prejudice. It is a direct attack upon the black man. There are scientists after finding that the Negro was the first and oldest race then sought to modernize the background of African history by asserting that the primitive or the first man descended from an anthropoid or ape-like man and from this anthropoid descended the Negrita and the Negro who were the first to evolve which was followed in succession of evolution of races such as the Negrito Negro, the Australian, the brown, the yellow, and the white. Thus, he builds a false hypothesis by saying that each evolving stage produces a new creation and that man became higher in intelligence, that each ascending chain produces a higher breed, which means that the further away that the breeding gets from the ape, the more human it becomes, and thus he makes the Negro the lower scale of human society. Such false teaching destroys the doctrine of the divine creation and severs the ties of the common brotherhood of man and impregnates the mind of various nations with a false conception of themselves, which already has proven to be destructive to the common welfare of man throughout the world. If the biological science of the brother brotherhood Man's relation to man had been taught and preached among the nations of the earth, and if the evolutionist has spent one-third of his interest in teaching the unity of nations rather than trying to prove man's relation to the monkey, this world today would have been a far more decent place for human habitations. I made another survey in my research work because I was very much concerned about where the evolutionist got the theory of evolving a species to build the hypothesis upon. I discovered that this, his false arguments that the first man sprang from the anthropoid or primate, something like an ape or the totemic man with the tail of a lion, ape or zoo type, was built from a premise of false legend because the old time theologian and anthropologists were ignorant of the totemic sign language. Totemic sign language has also found its expression in our Bible, in the mythology of Greece and Rome. It bears out an expression. If we only knew its interpretation, such terms as a lion with eagle wings, a leopard with four heads, and wings of a fowl, a half woman and half fish, the Egyptian spinnix with a woman's face and lion's body, or a man with a tail like a lion or an ape. Such terms have no zoological bearing. They are only parables and symbols of a thought conveyed. For further reference of the totemic man, read page 436, volume 1 of Ancient Egypt, the Light of the World by Gerald Massey. So William Darcy says in his book, Meeting Place of Geology and History, pages 22-23, it may also be objected that if held by some evolutionists, man developed from lower animals, even should some animals, either recent or past, be discovered intermediate in structure between man and the highest apes, we should still require proof that it was the ancestor of man for the occurrence of connecting former or otherwise as the fact stands. The earliest known remains of man are still human and tell us nothing as to previous developments. As to Negroes and monkeys, there is absolutely no comparison. Other races have far greater similarity to the monkey and ape than the Negro. The Negroes as a race have woolly and curly hair and thick lips, Monkeys and apes have straight hair and thin lips. 
If woolly hair had been a symbol of inferiority, the prophet Daniel and St. John the Seer of Patmos would not have featured in their prophecies of Jesus Christ, the Messianic King, as having hair like lamb's wool in the likeness of the black kings that ruled empires of the ancient East. John said that his feet looked like brass burned in a furnace. Revelation 1, chapter 14 and 15 verses. And even Buddha, the great founder of the religion that bears his name, was distinctly Negroid features, thick lips. He was a black man. John Finote, in his book Racial Prejudice, page 106 and 7, says about the Negro, We insist the odd progressing race which dominates that in their case evolution and progress go from the yellow and the white races to the Negro. His hair becomes in this way the supreme expression of progress, the goal towards which all the hair of other people ought to tend. Finot says, if man is more noble, as the distance between him and the anthropoid ape widen, it must not be forgotten that these monkeys have straight and little undulated hair resembling that of the yellow races and the American people and perceptibly approaching the Europeans. Berbers and Semites. The woolly hair of the Negro has nothing in common with apes. It procures for them in this way a decided advantage over men of other colors. The scientist Alexander Goldenweiser in book Early Civilization, page 4, says the Negro far developed external lips, a specially human trait, and in this particular, the Negro represents man physical more distinctly than any other race. The true history of the black man as a race for the past 500 years has been eliminated by many prejudiced writers who, with their high-sounding phrases and technical terms, a display of scholarship and vocabulary Larry, rather than basic facts or realities, place the Negro only as a slave from time immemorial as a hewer of wood and drawer of water, while there have been others who took a more liberal view. But even then, they were not definite enough in argument to build up resistance against the school of thought established. But in my research, I have been able to find enough reliable data of facts that the Negro's history to give a clear understanding and relinking his past with his present circumstances. Ethiopia, Egypt means black. The word Egypt, the land of the blacks. Ethiopia, sunburnt faces. A, the Garden of Eden and a Ethiopia, Africa as the cradle of the human race has been thoroughly established. Recent discoveries as well as old have thrown much light upon the subject with little if any conjecture to the Bible version of creation. B. Dr. Churchward, an English anthropologist in his book, page 11 and 12, The Evolution of Primitive Man, says, From studies I have made during many years, I am fully convinced that the preconceived ideas of many scientists as the origin of the human race as regards to dates and places are erroneous, and that the human race did not originate in Asia or any other part of the world but in Africa. C. Moses in his book of Genesis 12 verse 13 refers to Ethiopia. The second river that went out of Eden is Gashon, that is, it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. D. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says Gashon ran through Egypt and it notes that it rises in the east, which the Greeks called Nile, the river of Ham. E. The book called Egypt, the Light of the World, a translation from the Egyptian scriptures by Gerald Massey says, The Egyptian record when Red will tell us plainly that the human birthplace was a land of the pepperous reed at horn of the earth that is in the equator from where the sacred river ran to the valley of the Nile with plenty. The Gulf of Aden on the east coast of Africa is also a traditional name somewhat similar to Eden, the name of Adam's garden. F. 
Black Adam, Alexander Winchell, in his book, Pre-Adamics, page 158, says, There is indeed a legend in existence which has obtained a widespread currency according to which the first man was dark or black in complexion. There is even said to be a tablet in the British Museum brought by the late George Smith on which an inscription which lends strange countenance to the legend of the Black Adam. Mark K. 3364 British Museum Pre-Adamics. G. The book titled The Indigenous Races of the Earth by Not and gliding on page 510, quotes Dr. Volney and saying, It must be concluded that the process of nature and human species is the transmutation of the characteristic of the Negro into the European or the evolution of white varieties and the black races of men, which leads us to the inf- inf- inference that the primitive stock of men were Negroes, which has every appearance of truth, on the whole, there are reasons which leads us to adopt the conclusion that the primitive stock of men were probably Negroes. I know no argument to set on the other side. H. Colonel A. Brigham, in his volume, The Shadow of the Atlantis, page 206, quotes Dr. A. Herman, the German scientist in his research, who says, Come to the conclusion of the mysterious river Gazoon was nothing else than the Nile, and that therefore the site of Eden should be sought in Abyssinia, Ethiopia. I, Professor Jerome Dowd, capital D-O-W-D, in his volume Negro Races, volume 3, page 288, says, The connection between the Paleolithic man and the Negro is very apparent. The African Negro seems to be the survivor of the first inhabitant of the earth. The Paleolithic man who remain in Africa may have there developed a black skin and woolly hair, while those migrating north and east may have developed in transit the Caucasian and Mongolian that the white man originated in Africa. It is now generally conceded. Brigham says, Shadow of Atlantis, page 229. All this material proved that at one time the black continent was the home of comparatively elevated culture. And Professor Frobenius supposes that some regions of northern, western, and northern Africa at one time were subjected to mighty cultural influences. In fact, my personal interview of collaborator of Frobenius, Professor Obermeyer, I was able to glean that Professor Frobenius is included to seek the cradle of the human culture in Africa instead of Asia and to derive a prehistoric culture from the mysterious race which once populated the fertile region of the Sahara.